Changing your messaging is different from actually changing your beliefs. It's our turn to make some changes here, make something happen for ourselves. If you don't shoot your costume, we're not doing our job. Federal prosecutors indicted Robert Bowers, the man accused of killing 11 people in a Pittsburgh synagogue. He's been charged with 44 counts, including religious hate crimes and injuring police officers. Istanbul's top prosecutor made it clear that Turkey believes Saudi Arabia made, quote, plans in advance to kill Jamal Khashoggi. His first official statement says evidence shows that Khashoggi was strangled as soon as he walked into the Saudi consulate, and his body was dismembered and, quote, destroyed. Turkish and Saudi Arabian prosecutors met twice this week, but they can't agree on who has jurisdiction over the 18 suspects. The National Archives released one of the last sealed files from the Watergate investigation, after a federal judge sided with lawyers who argue that it might help Special Prosecutor Robert Mueller prove that his work has precedent. The document is a grand jury report laying out evidence of crimes by the Nixon administration, written for the House Judiciary Committee to review as it considered impeachment proceedings. The Taliban is assigning five top commanders who were each imprisoned for 12 years in Guantanamo Bay, to the militant group's political office in Qatar. American diplomats appear to be trying to restart negotiations to end the war in Afghanistan, and a Trump administration policy shift means the Taliban and the former commanders will now have a role in the peace talks. Thousands of active duty soldiers and Marines are on their way to the U.S.-Mexico border, supposedly in order to stop a caravan of 3,500 Central American asylum seekers. But no one really knows what'll happen when they get there. That includes the military itself. A couple of days ago, the Air Force general in charge of Northern Command kept it vague at a press conference. I think, I think the president has made it clear that border security is national security. That is the direction we've given, that's the direction that we're marching to. Then, off camera, the commander told Pentagon reporters that he didn't know yet what jobs they'd be asked to do, or how much it would end up costing. And today, President Trump said the initial deployment of 5,200 troops could grow to as many as 15,000. This isn't the first time that a president has deployed large numbers of troops to the southern border. George W. Bush did it in 2006, and Barack Obama followed suit in 2010. The Obama deployment, called Operation Phalanx, put 1,200 troops, all National Guardsmen, on the border for a little over a year. It cost roughly $160 million. Bush's deployment, Operation Jumpstart, involved 6,000 National Guardsmen over two years. That one cost taxpayers $1.2 billion. And how effective were they? Well, according to the two administrations, the troops in those operations helped in the apprehension of some 200,000 undocumented migrants at a cost of about 6,000 per person. But that word helped is pretty generous. It makes it sound like the troops were a lot more involved in border security than they actually were. Adam Isaacson, who monitors military activity on the border for the NGO Washington Office on Latin America, says the troops worked almost entirely behind the scenes. They were not patrolling the border. They were monitoring the sensors and they were, you know, they'd be doing the oil changes for the border patrol vehicles and, and maintaining equipment. And just a lot more of them also were sitting under tarps, sitting under tents, uh, in lawn chairs with binoculars, looking at the border, looking for anyone suspected of crossing. CBP officials say they're always happy to have more people around. They call it badges back to the border. When the military looks after their jeeps, that frees up more agents to go out on patrol. But there are already almost 20,000 border patrol agents working the border with Mexico. And earlier this year, after Trump sent a couple thousand guardsmen to reinforce them, CBP union officials publicly complained. There is something different about this new deployment, Operation Faithful Patriot. Trump is sending active duty military. While that sounds dramatic, in practice, it's probably gonna look much the same. For one thing, they're subject to a law that doesn't cover the National Guard, Posse Comitatus, which bans the use of active duty troops for domestic law enforcement purposes. It is within President Trump's power to override this by declaring a national security emergency, but that's not so easy. The president could give them that power on a temporary basis if you can really portray this as a national security emergency. 
I think the military itself, the Defense Department itself, will be the main ones pushing back and trying not to create dangerous precedents for how the military is used internally. The border is an unpredictable place, and 5,000 armed soldiers and Marines could make the situation even more combustible. But for now, this deployment is exactly what it looks like, a political stunt. Today, hundreds of immigrants showed up at immigration courts in cities like Orlando, Atlanta, and Boston, and were forced to wait in line for hours. According to immigration lawyers, that's because the courts didn't know these people were coming. It's a problem undocumented immigrants have been running into across the country in the past few months. And it's happening because ICE has given them notices to appear that have phantom or dummy dates. They were setting dates and times with people that were ordered to appear for court at 12 in the morning, where we know for a fact that there isn't a single court in this country that would have court at 12 a.m. Vice spoke to immigration lawyers in California, Florida, Illinois, Texas, and Georgia, who all have similar stories. That means that people who live, in most cases, very far away from an immigration court will bear the expense of buying a hotel, flying hundreds of miles, making arrangements to have legal counsel available, only to learn that, in fact, DHS is inventing dates and they don't have time. The problem started after a ruling by the Supreme Court this summer. Pereira v. Sessions focused on an undocumented immigrant from Brazil who received a notice to appear that didn't include a date or time. This was standard practice for ICE. Send an incomplete notice, provide details somewhere down the road. Every single one of my clients that I've had for the last three years has had that problem, and I guarantee you that this practice has been in place for at least a decade. Sounds relatively harmless, but this habit could have huge implications because of what's known as the 10-year rule. Picture a stopwatch. If you're an undocumented immigrant living in the U.S., Time starts ticking the second you arrive. If that watch makes it to 10 years, you get to stay. If you can prove you're of good moral character and you have a family member who has a green card or is a U.S. citizen. But if you get picked up by ICE and issued a notice at any time before the 10 years are up, time stops. That's what happened to Pereira. He got a notice before he hit the 10-year mark. But because his notice to appear didn't include a date and time, the Supreme Court invalidated it. That meant Herrera was allowed to stay in the U.S. So ICE started issuing phantom date notices to get around the court's decision. This is outrageous because a phantom date and time is clearly a bad faith attempt by the government to simply say, hey, here's a notice to appear, but completely undermines the reason why a date and time would be on a notice to appear. The government's strategy may have seemed clever, but if courts decide that including a phantom date is the same as putting down no date at all, it'll backfire. Tens of thousands of notices to appear, if not hundreds of thousands, could be tossed because of the ruling in prayer of recessions. In other words, ICE may have done exactly what it was trying to avoid, giving many undocumented immigrants the chance to stay in the country. Richard Cordray is the Democratic candidate for governor of Ohio. He used to run the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. He's a technocrat, literally, which isn't usually a recipe for political success, but it's working for him, largely because of one issue. You have experience in some of the more technical parts of government. Does that experience help with the approach to healthcare, with talking about healthcare and thinking about it? Healthcare, like consumer finance, is a subject that can get quite complicated in its details, but on the surface and, and as a top line matter, is not that complicated for people. In consumer finance, where I work, it's about people being treated fairly, people not getting cheated or mistreated. The financial system is supposed to serve everybody in our society, every consumer. And the healthcare system is supposed to s serve every patient in our society, every healthcare consumer. Not that different, really. The ACA gave millions of people with pre existing conditions equal access to health care. I think we need to make an investment in public transit. I think that should be an issue in the campaign. It took a while for the Obamacare smoke to clear, 
but now it's the most popular part of the law. That's why Cordray and other Democrats are warning voters that the Republican attempts to repeal the ACA would take away the protection for people with pre-existing conditions. And Republicans suddenly get it too. That's why even though they still say they're opposed to the ACA, they're running ads like these. Earlier this year, we learned our oldest has a rare chronic disease, pre-existing condition. So enough with the scare tactics. In Wisconsin, pre-existing conditions are covered. Force insurance companies to cover pre-existing conditions. And fighting for those with pre-existing conditions. You and your Democratic colleagues running for office have been talking about health care for a long time. Republicans have evolved on the issue. Why do you think that they've changed their messaging? You've said two things there. You've said Republicans have evolved, and you said Republicans have changed their messaging. I would agree that they've changed their messaging. But have they really evolved on this issue? I don't know that they have. You know, changing your messaging is different from actually changing your beliefs. Cordray's Republican opponent, Mike DeWine, was late to the game. But he's now running a health care ad, too. Family is at the core of everything Mike DeWine does. That's why he's always protected Ohio's families. It's why he supports health care coverage for people with pre-existing conditions. DeWine's ad doesn't say how he plans to protect people with pre-existing conditions. We followed DeWine on a day-long bus tour, and he talked about a bunch of things. Our administration will focus on jobs. But he didn't mention health care at all. Weird for someone who used to talk about it a lot. I have been against Obamacare. It needs to go away. It's not working. It can't, can't be sustained. We wanted to ask DeWine if he has a plan to protect people with pre-existing conditions and how it would work. But he wouldn't talk to us about health care either. What has your opponent said when you push him on his stance in favor of something like protecting people with pre-existing conditions and the lack of a plan to do that? Where's the beef? I don't get any rejoinder because there is no beef there. There's no plan. He has no way of doing this. It's just a talking point for him, and that's all it is. Is it impossible to both be in favor of repealing the Affordable Care Act and believing that people with pre-existing conditions should be protected? Is there no other way to do it? I'm not interested in some logical exercise about what's impossible. People have been working to try to protect pre-existing conditions for years, OK? We've only ever had one law in this country that managed to do it. It's the Affordable Care Act. Hello, my name is Tara. I work for the Rural Utah Project. Do you know if you're registered to vote for San Juan County? Would you like to register to vote today? What's the vote for? Tara Benali is an activist in San Juan County, Utah, where Native Americans could be about to take control of a majority of the seats on the county commission for the first time, ever. That's happening because a federal judge recently imposed new district lines to try to correct racial gerrymandering. The county has about 15,000 residents, 47% white and 49% Native American. Now the district boundaries actually reflect the Native American advantage. But shifting power isn't as simple as just redrawing the map. It's hard being out here in such a rural area where they don't have a lot of access to different information. There's been so much confusion going on with the redistricting and just secondhand information that isn't quite correct. Because many of the rural homes on the Navajo reservation here don't use formal addresses, the county has struggled to place some Navajo voters in the right districts. Benali has been re-registering people to help fix the problem. Oh, oh, what you think? Oh. There are other challenges too. Many Navajo don't speak English, so they need a translator to help them register or read the ballot. A lot of homes on the reservation are so remote, it can take weeks or even months to get mail. That's a problem in a county that votes mostly by mail. Then there's the long history of disenfranchisement. Utah was one of the last states to give all Native Americans the vote. In the state, Native Americans only got the right to vote in the 50s. Um, and there have been a lot of structural barriers to, mm -hmm. to going and voting for Native Americans. Do you think those issues are still at play here? They are. Discrimination is a very strong word. Prejudice is a very strong word as well. Those two concepts have really just been 
the barrier that everybody has put up. And so having to break down that barrier has been a challenge for me, especially going door to door and saying, you know, hey, this is, there's, there's a change going on here and we need to be a part of that change. It's our turn to make some changes here, make something happen for ourselves. Okay, um, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. The San Juan County Democratic Party is a small operation. It barely existed two years ago. Benali is kind of the party's Swiss army knife. She's a district chair, and she also serves as an informal campaign manager for Willie Gray Eyes, the Democratic candidate for the District 2 swing seat. So the plan is to start knocking on doors on Monument Valley since you're in the area. Gray Eyes got a late start. The county took him off the ballot for months after a Republican candidate claimed he didn't live in Utah. A judge restored his name, but with Election Day only weeks away, he's just now putting up campaign signs. Campaigning in a district where a Navajo person could be elected is new. Do you think you can win? If we can tell everybody on the Navajo Nation that it's for Navajo individual to become a commissioner, I would say yes. Some voters seem to be getting that message. Who are you going to vote for? Willie. Why Willie? We want somebody that's uh, a full Navajo to be in the office up there. But some haven't heard of Gray Eyes, or even that there's an election going on. First time I heard about him, um, I didn't know what she was running for. Some Is it co commissioner or what do you, yeah. I, I didn't know. <laughs> Gray Eyes isn't campaigning much in white areas, but that's where turnout tends to be strongest. In the past, midterm turnout in the country's Republican precincts has been around 20% higher than turnout on the reservation. He could still lose. So how many votes do you think the race could come down to? What I've heard is at least down to 30, so 50 to 30 votes. So it's going to be a really close vote. These these districts were redrawn, mm -hmm. um, giving sort of Navajos a, a big majority mm -hmm. in this district. Do you think that that means an automatic win for Willie? No, I don't feel like it's an automatic win, but you don't go out of your way to make something happen on a day-to-day -day basis from morning sun up to sunset and say, this is not gonna work, this is not gonna happen. You have to have that faith. Today, Prime Minister Narendra Modi unveils the world's biggest statue, a 597-foot-high iron effigy of Sardar Vallabhai Patel, one of India's founding fathers. At a cost of $400 million, the Statue of Unity is twice as tall as the Statue of Liberty and pushes China's Spring Temple Buddha out of the top spot. At first glance, Patel might seem like an odd choice for such a grand gesture. He's not as well known as the likes of Mahatma Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru. And like them, he belonged to India's Congress party, the main opposition to Prime Minister Modi's Hindu Nationalist Party, the BJP. But going into next year's elections, choosing Patel is a smart move. The BJP needs to appropriate national icons from the freedom struggle because it does not have icons of its own. Sadar Patel is being appropriated by the BJP because it also has an electoral benefit. The BJP can't claim the legacies of Gandhi and Nehru. The party wasn't around for the independence struggle, and their political predecessor, the RSS, was against the movement for self-rule. Patel actually banned the RSS for a while because one of its former members assassinated Gandhi. This is sheer irony that their political ancestors completely disregarded the freedom struggle, but today they feel that if they want to legitimate, legitimize the space in the Indian political horizon, they have to somehow or the other connect with the freedom struggle. The BJP sees Patel as a Hindu nationalist because he rebuilt a Hindu temple once destroyed by Muslim invaders. He was known as India's Iron Man for his willingness to use force to unify the country. And the BJP appreciates that. Mr. Modi wants to be known as the ultimate Iron Man. 
you know, quite often I have been asked, you know, that what do you think is Mr. Modi's real ambition? I said that his real ambition is to become politically immortal. Fifty years later, he would want the Prime Minister of that time to build the statue of Mr. Modi next to Sadar Patel, double the size. Modi's symbol of national unity won't be the tallest for long. He's already laid the foundation for an even bigger statue of a Hindu warrior king, the icon of another political party whose vote the BJP is after. We caught the first announcement of the contest. That's all I had to hear. Didn't read the specifics, didn't read anything else. I just saw, saw 30 hours in a coffin. My whole life, I would always say, oh, no, I'm fine. If I lose, I lose. Well, I ain't losing. I believe the winner is going to take the tune, I think, of $300, uh, two gold season passes, and then you get to keep the coffin. I've owned and operated a home haunt for the last 12 years, it's gotten bigger and bigger. It's free for the for the neighborhood kiddies. That's one of our mottos. If you don't shit your costume, we're not doing our job. My profession is a funeral director and embalmer. I got in late last night because of work. Um, had a couple of people pass very, very uh, quickly yesterday and together. So I had a couple of families I had to meet with and some embalming to do before I could get here. <laughs> I don't know if I'll win. I'm not sure. It depends on, I don't like to be scared because then when I am embalming someone at two o'clock in the morning by myself, I think about it, so. Ladies and gentlemen, may you please bow your head in silence for the soon to be departed. (laughs) 45,000 people applied to be part of the Six Flags Coffin Challenge. Six Flags reviewed all the entries and they came up with Stacy, Matt, Brian, a college student, a vampire enthusiast, and a Navy vet. And for the next 30 hours, they became one of Six Flags' most viral stories that didn't involve somebody actually dying in a park. Contestants could eat free meals, use their phones, and get out for a bathroom break every hour. So how's it going? Good to go, not too bad. Is it feeling worth it so far? Oh, it's been a blast. This has proven to my kids, you put your mind to it, you can do it, man. You can do anything you want to do, even if it's something as dumb as this. think about the coffin challenge? How do you think it's been going? Well, they're not dead yet, so not good enough, apparently. (laughs) After 24 hours, theme parks kind of start to suck. Man, I'm dead. Did. You know, I don't even know what time it is now, but I'm I'm definitely feeling a little tired. My back hurts because there's like no mattress in this thing. <laughs> Six Flags got the publicity. You may rise from your graves. <laughs> Park goers got some free entertainment, and six people got their coffins a little early. Was it worth it? Absolutely worth it. Honestly, really? I would easily do this all over again. How's it feel to be out? How's it feel to be done? Uh, so it's good to be out and done. Thankfully, I'm ready to go home and sleep. <laughs> is this going to help you for your career, do you think? I mean, we're going to have promoters calling us. I mean, how can, how can you lose? 